It's not fun! You two have demons you're trying to compensate for! Well, what about you? You're having a glass of wine! Top of the morning to you, Mattis! Oh my god, that was awful. But I am part Irish, so I am allowed to do this ridiculous accent. See, I had a plan all along, sort of. I actually wanted to talk about Patrick Starr next, but I needed a little gamble. And for Patrick, the script got kinda hard to write because I could not nail down a single theme. Thankfully, with this entry, I will have made one video entry each on all five of the main characters. Yes, Butters is a main character, you plebs. Hi, I'm Kenny Monk, and I'm here to talk to you about South Park, or more specifically, Stan Marsh. But not just Stan, him, his father Randy, and his grandpa Marvin. Did not realize until recently that Marvin shares his name with another South Park Marvin until I got to my comment section. However, we will not talk about Jimbo. He's like Bruno. My brother Jimbo, who is in the hospital! Yeah, Uncle Jimbo. Jimbo's a fat alcoholic who'd be in the hospital anyway. In my heart, Jimbo is a marsh, but he's not needed for this section. Anyhow, happy St. Patrick's Day! It's even better because I'm recording this video on a Sunday night from the one and only Beantown, the hub of the universe, Boston, Massachusetts. Well, Revere, Massachusetts. Sorry, they were cheaper than Boston. But it's in the Boston metropolitan area, much like Schomburg and Chicago. Spring break! Some of you might be curious is why I'm discussing the marshes, considering what today is. Well, the Credigree episode said that Randy, and by extension, likely also his son and father, are Irish. Across the street selling weed also. And the owner is actually 10% Irish! So they meet the minimum criteria. Anyhow, I have been wanting to discuss the Marshmen, not just Stan. Because honestly, as much as they might bicker and whine, they actually have many things in common. Besides a last name, there's their cynical views on life, immaturity, hypocrisy, a glazed look in the eye, and most importantly, addiction tendencies. Each of the Marshmen has their own vices, but at the end of the day, they just can't control themselves, nor their dopamine rushes. It's all very psychological. Anyhow, let's discuss. Stan is one of the main characters of the show, and at one point in time, basically the main character. Like, the one character we constantly follow. Stan is known for being the straight man. However, whereas Kyle generally leads the campaign against all crazy, wacky stuff, Stan is more often than not content to simply just sit around and complain about stuff while it happens. As a result, he's generally the group leader, with Kyle as the second in command. Except when they come together, it's fourth graders, then Cartman leads the charge. However, that's not to say Stan is a picture-perfect child. Contrary to the lyrics of the Mountain Town song, he has flaws. This is how he starts to take after his father, Randy. Like his son, Randy is the leader to the rest of the dads, despite being dumber than a sack of feathers. Be it when he told them to beat the hell out of the UPS man, or when he does something as simple as breathing. I've always thought that Randy and Stan are meant to be a reflection of you when you realize you're just like your parents. But the point is made that you don't have to be like them, and it all depends on how you deal with those issues. At least Randy's better than his father, Marvin. Well, let me tell you something, Porky. Your mom was over here earlier, and I humped her like a little... What? In the episode, Jeff, we're introduced to Marvin, Stan's grandpa and Randy's father. Marvin, surrounded by his family, celebrates his 102nd birthday. Damn, dude. And he's not happy about it. Blow out the candles, grandpa. <laughs> Hooray! Aw, oh, just like me on my birthday! Except without the huge mental breakdowns that immediately follow, Marvin, realizing he's older than most people, wants to not be alive anymore, if you catch my drift, and thinks Stan might ultimately be the key to getting him to that fate. I'm not gonna kill you, Grandpa. Why not? Cause I'll get in trouble. I killed my grandpa when I was your age! Keep this in mind going forward. What has America's youth come to? Kids won't even kill their own grandparents! Um, that's why we have nursing homes, so they can do the work for us? Shady Pines, ma. Shady Pines. Or would you rather be released to elsewhere? Is, is it okay to kill somebody if they ask you to, because they're in a lot of pain? My son? Yes? I'm not touching that with a 60-foot pole. 
Okay, this is how you know the episode was made super early in the show's run. The topic of euthanasia has gained a lot of traction in the last few years, for many controversial reasons I don't feel comfortable getting into. Regardless, the episode does not want to talk about any of the reasons somebody would be for or against it. Whenever you think somebody will offer their opinion, they just deflect. If this episode came out now, I think they would have more to say than just, sorry, not our taste. Eh, moving on. Randy and Sharon hear about Terrence and Philip back before they caused Armageddon trying to get it off the air and allow Marvin to babysit the kids while they go protest, which I'm sure will turn out super fun and create all sorts of fun memories for years to come. Are you ready, Grandpa? There's a pub crap in the woods! Um, Marvin, I don't think the Vatican actually has woods, so the answer would likely be a resounding no. Near the end of the episode, there is one thing that changes Marvin's mind. The spirit of his own grandpa, aka the grandpa he helped on alive, telling him that if he commits the act, he will be darned for all of eternity! You're wrong to put little Billy in it now! You're so obsessed with ending your life, you're not thinking about what you're doing to his. Natural causes, Billy. Natural causes. Eh, is that really such a big deal? In this world, hell is just a normal place with fire. They even have luau's. I'm sure this could also apply to Limbo, but it convinces Marvin to change his mind. And so he does, sort of. I'm planning a trip to Africa. Did you know over 400 people are eaten naturally by lions in Africa every year? Why what? You know, I kind of wonder if Randy himself ever had to kill his grandpa, aka Marvin's father. Maybe it's like some weird family tradition. Kind of sucks that Randy wasn't exactly a character back then, since I could easily see this being a plot point today. Maybe Randy could encourage the murder if he found out. Damn, I get to kill my grandpa, and so do you. Sometimes in life, you have to do things you just don't wanna. Nonetheless, this isn't the only time Stan understood his grandpa better than his father did. In Grey Dawn, they cover the topic of seniors behind the wheel. Since this is before Ubers, and they likely live in a mountain town without street lights or public transit, seniors drive erratically. <laughs> Is that a stop sign back there? I think I hit a pothole. Well, erratically is the wrong word to put it. They might as well get behind the wheel of a tank with the body counts they rack up. Find good people who were run over in the street by an elderly woman driver. Marvin calls a meeting of the senior citizens, and as they all have to get out at once, this means complete and total chaos, the likes of which this town has never seen. Oh my. God. Randy goes to warn the boys. Look. Whoa, whoa, calm down, spam a lot. You gotta run a little faster. As a result, the townsfolk make it a rule that the seniors have to turn over their licenses. Gotta go to work, pick up your medicine, or gotta buy food. Sucks to be you. The needs of the young outweigh the needs of the old. But how am I supposed to get to the grocery store or the pharmacy to buy medicine? Shut up! I'm 23 and I can't drive, but I dream about it every single night. Why's that? Cartman is all excited. He gets to go run in the street like a ruffian, but Marvin disobeys the law and forces the kids to drive around with him simply to prove a point. Could I see your license, please? I ain't got one, you <laughs> took it! Why does this remind me of The Little Prince? The movie with Jet Bridges and Mackenzie Foy, not the book. Marvin gets put in jail for the offense, and Randy goes to bail him out. We're not treating you like children, Dad, alright? Now I think you owe Mr. Police Officer an apology. Who needs to apologize, hmm? Who's a sorry sorry? Kiss my sagging- <laughs> Something tells me that bad future or not, Randy and Stan would have had this exact same dynamic. I mean, they kinda did, right? The struggles of the seniors get the attention of the AARP. Ha! There you go, Mr. Smartmouth! Look at you now! Dad, what are you doing? The ARP is gonna help us take this town until we get our licenses back! Who lock the town down and trap all the adults. Stan attempts to reason with Randy and get him and the other parents to fight back. But they are unable to. Why is everyone letting the old people do this? They've tried to stop them, son, but the seniors get up so early in the morning, they 
Get everything done before everyone else is even awake. Stanley, you'll understand when you're older. Stan and the boys are able to get the seniors to retreat by closing down their headquarters, the Country Kitchen Buffet. And not a moment too soon because the AARP is getting carried away with their plans. I appreciate what the AARP is trying to do for us, but... Uh... All we want is our licenses back. Even Marvin is super uncomfortable. We're gonna take the whole country back. Wipe out everyone below the age of 65. Wipe them out? What are you, senile? Well, on the one end, you guys were the first people to get the shot after current events. So maybe in a roundabout way, you got justice, if only temporarily. With the country kitchen buffet closed, the seniors retreat like squirrels during the winter. The town is back in the hands of the middle-aged and young, and Randy rubs his non-existent nose in it. Learned his lesson, huh? Don't you feel silly now, Dad? Spurned on by Stan, Randy realizes it was wrong to mistreat the father who treated him like crap all his life, while Marvin learns that he should take it a little easy. Lesson learned, they all go home. All Grandpa wants is not to be talked to like a child. Be proud that you made it through life to be a senior, but you should also realize that when you get behind the wheel, you're a killing machine. Let's just go home. Sure, I'll drive. <laughs> That's our grandpa. Uh, what? Anyhow, I think it's fair to say that Marvin, Randy, and Stan all have some traits in common. Primarily, their cynicism. All of the Marshmen, excluding Jimbo, don't see the forest for the trees, but rather the litter, the pollution, the Lorax, and the gender reveal parties gone wrong. Marvin had a miserable seniorhood. He outlived all of his friends and immediate family, even his border collie patches. As a result, he developed this cynical mindset as life went on. It did not seem to get any better. When he was younger, he made a lot of choices that he did not care would affect the people of the future. As we learn in the Man Bear Pig two-parter, Marvin and his friends are ultimately the ones responsible for Man Bear Pig's rampage. They wanted nice things and Man Bear Pig promised them. I didn't want to give the demon his stuff back. What stuff? All our cards and premium boutique ice cream. However, they only fought in the short term. Marvin made the deal with the knowledge that Man Bear Pig would come and wreck a huge amount of violence a few decades from then. We thought we'd be dead by now. We didn't think we'd have to live to see the consequences. Because clearly, Fosty and Bargains take your lifespan into account. Uh huh, maybe this is why he wanted Stan to off him. This creature shows up and. It seemed like a good deal for everyone in town. You didn't stop to think about what it would mean for us? Yeah, couldn't you have wished for something better? Like affordable housing, or car insurance that isn't super expensive? Or what about love? Don't you want someone to care about you? In fact, I think it would be fair to say that as a form of karma, Marvin was punished by being a father. After all, he never wanted kids. However... That's why I always came on Gram Gram's... <laughs> Ah. But then one night, I'm a- Ew, Marvin, ew, ew, gross, ew, 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 no. This is YouTube, and my South Park videos have already gotten me in enough trouble as is. But in the end, all those luxuries meant nothing. Just saying that I wasn't thinking about the future because your father was supposed to be nothing but dried up crust on Graham Graham's- <laughs> Now, an old man, surrounded by nothing but the emptiness of his mistakes, all Marvin wants is a bullet. To make matters worse, Stan tries to renegotiate a deal with Man Bear Pig, but finds he's no better than his grandfather. Nobody wants to give anything up, and Stan knows that pushing the idea is a fool's errand. Just plain rice? Yeah, it's what I thought. So he doesn't bend any further, and the best he can do is make sure the carnage comes a little later. Marvin notices the hypocrisy and how history is just repeating itself, and he promptly comments. Possibly talk about restructuring a new deal? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, I thought so. Shut up, Grandpa. Then there's Stan and Randy coming to that same conclusion. In the cynicism two-parter, Stan celebrates his birthday at Whistling Willie's Pizza. The big 1-0. Oof. And Cartman does too. Wait, wait, it's Stan's birthday. Yes, every time somebody gets a birthday present, Eric gets one too. Otherwise, he gets a little upset. 
No wonder you needed to hire a dog whisperer to get Carmen to behave. Hopefully you bought him that Mega Man he wanted. One of the presents Stan receives is a tween wave album, which Sharon refuses to let him listen to. Stanley, you have plenty of other gifts to enjoy. Looks like somebody's on the rag, huh, man? Randy finds out that Sharon confiscated one of Stan's presents. Sharon? Stan told me you took away his music CD at his birthday party. Um, why were you not at your son's own birthday party? And he isn't happy about it. Well, do you really think we should be telling our son what music he can and can't listen to? Yes, I do, if it's that stupid tween wave garbage. You know what? I'm kind of on Randy's side this time around. To me, unless a kid is copying what they see, they should be allowed to view or listen to whatever they want. Albeit, yes, there are obvious exceptions. But I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about this. Obviously, the one exception would be Lord of the Rings. I hear it's worse than Backdoor 9. And Backdoor 9 makes capers free look like not Naughty nurses too. Sure, the tween wave music sounds terrible, but from what I can tell, it's just noise. Which, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't all music just noise? I might not like all of the music that younger people are listening to. Seriously, who is Bad Bunny? So what? People like it. Who am I to judge? Unfortunately, I can't play the tween wave music to prove my point. Thanks, umpeg, UMPG. Randy thinks that Sharon is upset because she's acting her age, but to her, it literally sounds like somebody is holding a microphone up to a toilet and defecating. Ew, it's making me nauseous. Hopefully they aren't defecating onto the microphone because that can damage it and microphones are expensive as is. Again, cannot play it. I'm telling you, our music was better. Back in my day, our music was better. Not this garbage the youngins listen to. Warbu, warbu, warbu. For some reason, I always think of Spongebob when I watch this scene. The parents decide that the boys are not allowed to listen to the music, and that includes Randy. As in, he can't listen to the music, he's part of the boy group. Ugh, God, that's so unfair! But that's our music, we like it! Yeah, it's good! Which, look, I can get Sheila agreeing with Sharon and Gerald just going along with it because that's his wife, but Leanne, Carol, and Stuart actually pay attention to their children and don't spoil them. That's weird. That's not true! I think tween wave music is complex and awesome and it speaks to my youthful, rebellious spirit, Sharon! Again, why am I reminded of Spongebob? Later that night, Stan tries to listen to the music behind his mother's back and finds that holy crap on a stick, she's right. It really does sound like human waste product. To make matters worse, the brown outlook on life does not stop there. Soon, everything starts to look and sound and feel like Mr. Hanky's leftovers. Stan goes to a doctor to find a solution. Hopefully not the same doctor who diagnosed him with racism. Is it? I'm too lazy to Google. The doctor runs a few tests and finds out Stan's problem. With you, somehow the wires have gotten crossed and everything looks and sounds like <laughs> to you. It's a condition called being a cynical <laughs> asshole. In other words, as Stan is getting older, he's beginning to develop a negative outlook on life, which will only get worse with age. And much like the owl beast, there is no cure. No well, there kind of is a medicine you can take for it. We'll get to that when we get to that. Worst of all, it's genetic. For example, Randy had dreams of being a rock star, but he had to settle for the second kind of rock, the boring kind. Geology! You had dreams of being a rock star when you were younger. It's called getting older, Randy. It's okay. Well, Sharon, Randy would eventually become a successful musician under the persona of a New Zealand team named Lord, and his lyrics are so influential that the Broadway adaptation of Moulin Rouge borrowed them. But at the same time, this newfound fame was under a persona. It wasn't the true Randy. So maybe I kind of understand the hole in his heart. Somewhere else, Stan can cope with his diagnosis, and his friends don't understand him anymore. What did the doctor say? He said I have cynicism. What's that? Something you can get when you get older, but it's stupid. I'm not cynical. Which honestly feels weird. Like, I get it's only for this one episode, but you would think that all of the boys would have some level of cynicism. Or they would see the exact same things that Stan sees, but just not care or something. I don't know. This was the later seasons when they mostly stopped acting like kids. Oh, come on, we're playing L.A. Noir. 
Uh, who plays video games to listen to a bunch of characters talk and press the X button? So, they're playing Telltale? No wonder they went out of business. Anyhow, wherever Stan goes, he just sees sugar and honey and iced tea compiled into one smelly beast. Ew. And it's hurting his friendships, him and Kyle especially. Look, Stan, we, we just wanted to be able to go to the movies and enjoy ourselves, you know? I'm sorry, but... You're a bummer to be around. Sorry, Kiel. You wouldn't understand. Your dad is a god. Stan's dad is a clod. Just like Paradox predicted. A little young to be so pessimistic, aren't you, kid? Why? Just get me the cheeseburger and tell the chef to go easy on the- <laughs> Stan, she's gonna spit so hard on that burger. The boys start to do activities behind Stan's back, as they can't take his new mindset. The only thing that doesn't seem like told <laughs> to me are my friends, and they're all sick. Dude, you said you wouldn't say everything looks like- <laughs> Sorry if I see things for what they are. Wait a sec. Stan doesn't want his friends to leave him, but he continues being a cynical a-hole so much that they eventually do. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Stan promises to behave, and so he does, for less than five seconds. Come on, people. That's it, Stan. I'm not sitting through a whole movie with you. Uh, dude, dude, wait, I'm sorry. Anger, the boys break off their friendship with Stan, leaving the bro ship with only free members. Sorry, Butters is not in this episode. I think he might make a cameo, but I'm wrong. Dude, we don't want to hang out with you anymore. Get it through your head. Oh no, how will this affect Kenny? You know he's as fragile as a rose dipped in liquid nitrogen. Meanwhile, Randy, spurned on by Sharon, creates his own tweenway persona, Steamy Ray Vaughn. I smell a lawsuit. Or maybe that's just doo-doo. You know, only because Randy is old and bold, he hears tween wave as plain old poo. Meaning his entire act consists of just screaming and farting into a microphone. Rose. Only time I'm glad I'm not allowed to show music. In one of his acts, he brings a woman on stage, who he calls Steamy Ray Nix. Or Steamy Nix, one of those. And Sharon finds out. Obviously, she's probably not his sneaky leak, but for Sharon, it's practically the last straw. First, you're obsessed with baseball fights. Then you need to play Warcraft. Then you gotta be a celebrity chef. Why can't you ever just support me? Hold on, time for a tangent. What you need to know is at the start of the series, Randy was a totally different character. Basically, he was a caricature of Trey Parker's father, who was also named Randy. Randy Parker was known for being super calm at everything, which is why in Randy's first appearance, he does this. Oh my god, a volcano! Randy's stoicism mostly stayed the same, even if he could sometimes get to be a little too crazy, like in the episode of Spontaneous Combustion or Clubhouses. However, as the show progressed, Trey began to relate more to Randy as he got older, meaning that Randy got to be flanderized, as did the rest of the Marsh family. The Marshes firmly settled into a dynamic where Randy was the typical idiot cartoon dad, and Sharon was the housewife who had to mind her children and her her husband. All of Randy's schemes in the past few seasons, baseball fights, World of Warcraft, cream fresh, the thing he did when the internet went away, it meant something. Because I'm unhappy, okay? I've been unhappy for a long time. Oh god, Randy is having a midlife crisis. And his son, an octant crisis? What? They don't have a word for it, so I made it up. Quarter life crisis is like early 20s. I guess one half of one eighth. Every week it's kind of the same story in a different way, but it, it just keeps getting more and more ridiculous. Yeah, and sometimes it splits off for half of the year, and nowadays it's like it just takes breaks for as long as 10 months, and only has six episodes in general. It's like they're making a baby in that time. It's weird, I know, and it actually led to a lawsuit. Realizing both are unhappy, and staying together for the kids is a toxic mindset, they finally decide to divorce. They sell the house for what won't be the last time, and they move apart. Sharon gets the kids in a little apartment, and Randy goes off to fulfill his wild escapades. Meanwhile, with Stan gone, Kyle and Cartman form an unlikely friendship. Clearly, Kyle forgot about all the times Cartman was cruel to him. Anyhow, that brings us to part two. 
Sorry, I can't say the title, so it's gonna be part two. Stan has been settling into his new life about as well as grease rags in a bucket. He still sees everything, like rounded up coffee crimes, and he still hears that awful, awful noise. It is awful, it's wormy. Thankfully, I can't show either. Thankfully. Too bad this episode came out on October 5th, 2011, and the mental health stigma was still there. Later that day, the school is making the girls get vaccinated against the human butterfly virus. Hey, all the girls will go to the gymnasium for their vaccinations, and boys will head on out to recess. Okay, I know that's not really what it's called. I know the second one starts with a P, okay? I just, I don't really care about YouTube at this point. I just can't pronounce it. Carmen doesn't like this because according to the news, if you get vaccinated, against anything, you will suddenly grow hamburgers in your underwear. Wait, there's a disease called Asperger's? Yes! You are so lying, there is no disease called- <laughs> Wait, Carmen learned that if you stuck food up your butt and poop came out your mouth, it was actually healthier. So wouldn't growing hamburgers in your butt be a good thing? Also, you might become highly artistic. Gonna make us all get shots again, but this time it's so that we don't get warts in our. <laughs> um, actually, it's used to prevent certain forms of cancer. For your information, Cartman. Anyhow, even if Kyle and Cartman at this point in time are biffles, some things never change. Cartman can't believe they're. There's a disease out there that causes you to develop butt burgers. So he makes some burgers of his own and goes to the school nurse, hoping to likely exploit it the same way he does with every other illness. What are you talking about? I got vaccinated from the school and now clearly I have asthma. Yeah. Very funny. Well, I'm glad you think yeah. it's funny. Just note my condition on your records there. Somehow. It turns out Cartman does not meet the correct criteria to be thoroughly diagnosed. Also, I heard this. I don't know how true it is, but isn't his burgers, the name or the condition, sort of considered outdated? Like, nowadays, it's like saying you're manic depressive, not bipolar. God, shut up! Oh, sorry, Stan. I just like to be thorough and connect with my audience. Furthering Stan's diagnosis, Maggie further says he's a Debbie Downer. Oh, maybe he could be on SNL. And because Stan got vaccinated against the flu, oh no, how dare he protect himself against an illness? Clearly, all of his troubles come from his burgers. Get up. He's disinterested, depressed, self-loathing. It's most likely the reason his mother and I got divorced. I thought you and Sharon got divorced because you were both unhappy. Way. I did get that flu shot on my birthday. Maybe it's messing with my brain. No, it's not. <laughs> Wendy suggests they should try and give Stan an intervention. After all, tallies did work out pretty well. All his negativity is starting to make me depressed. I have to let him go. And whatever happens next, I'm going to embrace with a totally positive attitude. We just have to say it, didn't you, Q? Cartman comes strolling by, angry that the nurse did not like his hamburgers. Wanting to be a good friend, Kyle gives them a try. That's awesome. I'd love one. <clears throat> try this hamburger. Cartman made them himself. Wow, what is that? Seriously, Cartman, you can make money with these. <clears throat> Is Carmen the genius brain behind Fuddruckers? Is he the reason it tastes so overdone and dry? Sorry if I'm bringing up a subplot, but trust me, it's necessary for the ending. Because Stan is autistic, he's told to go to a support group for people like him, even if he's nothing like the people there. <laughs> To make matters worse, or weirder, they're actually all part of the Matrix. In this world, Asperger's is a disease meant to cover up cynicism. Wait, it's not a real illness? Of course not. If there was a social development disease, you wouldn't call it ah! That's just, that's just mean. Okay, I know my Cartman video, I brought up this scene and I got a ton of flack about it. Part of that came from my disability rep video. A few people said they disliked this episode because of what it says about autism. So I thought the general consensus was this episode was to the autistic community, what say Mr. Garrison's fancy new was for the trans community. But it turns out I was wrong. A lot of people like it, even those on the autistic spectrum. Personally, I don't think the episode was created to make fun of autism or 
where people win it. It was created to make fun of people who think vaccines cause autism. Guys, that doesn't happen. The dude who created the theory outright admitted he made it up like a couple of years before this episode came out. I do think the one thing they are trying to say is, yeah, it's funny that there's something out there literally called this, but they're not trying to say, oh, haha, ha, this exists. After all, everybody else would rather believe that Stan has autism than give him the help he needs to overcome his very obvious depression. The support group tells Stan they have the key to overcoming his cynicism. He needs to drink enough alcohol to drown a chicken. You know, kind of like his daddy. But we'll get there when we get there. Meanwhile, Cartman starts his own little business, based off of the burgers, ew. And Kyle helps. We need more! It's alright, I think another batch is just finishing off in our top secret flavor enhancer. Alright, these are good to go. <laughs> you know, episodes like this make me paranoid when I go out to eat at restaurants. But Cartman does not tell anybody, not even kill, the secret ingredient. Or ingredients, depending on what he had for dinner the night before. The alcohol cure works, and Stan finally finds joy in life, even if everything is vastly different. Oh well. You piece of <laughs> up. I love you. Wait, he's just like his father. Like, literally, this would be a conversation between Randy and Sharon. On the other hand, the other fast food companies are beginning to lose money because of Cartman Burger, and they force Stan, on pain of death, to get the secret recipe for them. Oh, right. Like a friend would walk out on somebody who was diagnosed with a serious illness. And all right. Angered, Stan snaps one more time. I don't want everything to go back to the way it was. I, I don't. Oop, he spoke too soon, because off-screen, Sharon and Randy got back together, and Stan's life is back to normal, and show is the status quo. Yay! And as you get older, you realize, the best thing to do is just stick with what you know. Look, I hate to say it, but I wish this was a bigger thing, like its own little plot, because this was not the first time the show had Randy and Sharon divorce. In the episode Clubhouses, the pair do so, but Stan desperately wants them to get back together, mostly because his new stepdad is annoying. This is happening way too fast. Oh, Jesus, when are you gonna cut me some slack, huh? I have taken you under my wing and done my best, and all you ever do is whine and moan about it. Kid, I get it. Just ask him, are you my new daddy? And he'll run to the hills. Eventually, the pair get back together in a super meaningful scene. I'm serious, please. Truth or dare? Truth. Do you still love me? Oh, Randy, I do love you, but now I'm so confused. I know what they're doing here, and I'm not saying they had to repeat clubhouses, but I wish that this time it was a little meaningful, especially considering what we learned in the past episode. Maybe Sharon and Randy realize they don't like each other, but they have to put that aside to help Stan. That inspires them to put more work into the custody agreement or stuff like that. And because of it, it makes them realize what made them love each other in the first place. Thankfully, Stan still has his alcohol, and you know what they say, a bourbon a day keeps the curse at bay. Unthankfully, he now has to spend the rest of his life in a drunken daze. And with some implication, that's exactly what's wrong with Randy. He drinks so much, not just because of self-control problems, but because it's the only way he can get through the day. As we saw in Bloody Mary. Thank you, Paranormal Activity, for making me scared of bathroom mirrors. But I want to hold off on this episode because I have something bigger planned. I know I said this video was mostly focused on the marshmallow Males, except for Jimbo, sorry Jimbo. But to some degree, I think Shelly has the same disease. Only instead of developing it later in life, she was born with it. The worst part is, she occasionally tries to avert it, but outside consequences always step in to keep her from the straight and narrow. The biggest is in Broadway Bro Down. After taking Sharon to see the touring production of Wicked, Randy finds out the secret of Broadway. Broadway musicals are specifically designed 
think to get women as hungry for BJ's as a starving dog on a meat-free diet. Wait, aren't the Jonas Brothers gonna perform a few shows at the Marquee Theater? You know, the same theater BJ was in before they had. Holy cow, things are really coming full circle. Eh, maybe I'm immune from it. Anyhow, to get his money's worth, Randy takes Sharon to Manhattan for a week-long trip and leaves Stan and Shivy with the Fegans. No, Dad, please don't do this. The Fegans are a family of vegans, or vegans before it was cool and trendy. They were life preservers and abstained from eating meat. However, not every vegan is a willing vegan, and not just because it rhymes. For example, their son, Larry, hates their lifestyle. It made him soft and a target for bullies. Shelly was one of them. Come on, vegan eater jumper, get off! Go! Go! At dinner, Shelly, who's already over all of it, unintentionally comes to his defense. Maybe you should let your son decide that for himself. Maybe if Larry had a nice steak once in a while, he wouldn't get beat up by every kid in school. Larry develops a crush on Shelly as she inspires him to take off his life preserver and try meat. Today, I went to 7-Eleven and I ate a Slim Jim. It was the greatest thing I ever tasted. Trust me, kid, it's so good. What's next? Is he gonna try gluten? I'd be careful if I were you. You know that gluten makes your private parts fall off like a rocket ship, right? Sharon gives Shelly and Larry to get stuck wicked, which is bad news for Randy. This is what I get. I drank from the lie that is Broadway and now it has my daughter. Clearly, every woman in a Broadway musical is hungry like the wolf. Randy, wanting to get his daughter out of there, dresses up like Reef Carney, free Hades Town. In the process, he gets the show canceled. Sorry, folks, we're in a hold. We're in a hold. <sighs> However, his actions also caused a pipe to burst and the theater to flood. And since Larry never learned how to swim and took off his life preserver, he drowned. Shelly is absolutely devastated. Just know that. For Spider-Man to have done what he did, he must have had a very good reason. Spider-Man works in mysterious ways, Shelly. And wherever he is, he loves you. Okay, I'm not Shelly's biggest fan, but even I hated Randy in the last tail end of this episode. Then there's Goobax. The boys find out that the future is so terrible that people from the future are coming back to the past, offering to work for next to nothing and putting that money into savings accounts. Stan is happy at the idea of future people. Initially, he and the boys have been offering snow shoveling services, but their usual clients have given the positions to the future people because they offered to work for pennies. Who? One of those immigrants from the future. He said he would do it for 25 cents. 25 cents? Well, that's not even worth it. Spurned on by the rednecks, they decide... <coughs> they took your jams! They took your jams! They took your jams! They took your jams! I've been wanting to say that for so long. Randy chastises Stan for his line of thinking. You might want to just stop for a second and think about how crappy the future really is. That's right, we're not raising our son to be an ignorant time cyst. Yeah, plus one of your maids is a future person. It's just rude, Stanley. Stan attempts to listen to his father, then he goes out to eat. Uh, yeah, I want a double cheeseburger and fries. Chicken sandwich? Couldn't you order a chicken sandwich? Something tells me that if you did, the dude from the future would just make you a double cheeseburger. Eventually, Stan's patience wears out, and he goes off. I want a goddamn cheeseburger and some goddamn fries, you <laughs> goo bags! Stan Marsh! Uh ah! Uh. Oh hey, it's like Randy. Stan gets grounded for the remark and likely denied his food, and Randy takes him to his office to be sure the grounding stays in place. Too bad Randy no longer has an office. They took my job! See, the Marshmen, minus Marvin, decide to get rid of the people from the future. Randy decides the best thing to do is to have carnal relations with other men, despite the fact he's married. That way, there won't be any children and no future, and the people from the future won't exist to come back and take their jams. And why does this remind me of Zeke from Attack on Titan? Cheese and crackers, all these references. Stan instead has a much better plan. I mean, maybe if we all commit right now to working towards a better future, then. 
then the future won't be so bad and these immigrants won't need to come back here looking for work. They try it and surprisingly it works. But then at the last minute, they decide that what they're doing is boring and that Zeke was right all along. Okay, sorry, my bad. Uh, everyone back in the pile. Back in the pile, everyone. Then there's the biggest way the Marshmen are alike. And you know which episode it is. One of my personal favorites, Freemium isn't free. Jimmy, who is now a pusher hired by Canada, starts to get the boys interested in the new Terrence and Philip mobile game, aka a freemium game. A game that is initially free, but then they offer to make it more fun by paying a small fee. Oh, that rhymes. A lot of rhymes in this video. For most freemium games, you either pay for stuff like coins, or you pay to turn off those annoying pop-up ads. And you can't use airplane mode to disable the ads. They know now. Trust me, they are clever a-holes. So how's the Terrence and Philip game? In this game, you are Terrence and Philip. Can you collect all the Canadian coins? It's basically just the Family Guy and Simpsons mobile games, but way more uninspired and transparent. The suburban housewife of mobile games. While Kyle and Butters dislike the game, Stan is tempted to try it, and he becomes hopelessly addicted. $489 on a mobile app? I'm sorry, I didn't realize I spent that much. He seems like a modern day I Justine. Randy thinks Stan is acting like his grandpa Marvin. Because it's gambling, so addiction tendency or not, he clearly did not get it from his father. I had a problem, but I was able to stop. Now I only drink gluten-free beer and wine. Stan's addiction reaches such a peak that he stays home from school and doesn't get out of bed simply so he can play the game. Dude, I bought like $10 worth of Canada. But check it out, I unlocked a stadium in Toronto. You spent $10 and 8 hours to unlock a stadium. Fearing for his mental state, Randy takes Stan to see his grandpa in action. God, the Italian in my blood salivates upon seeing that casino. I haven't been to one of those in so long, I miss the free drinks. Oh god. Boston has a casino, right? However, neither Marvin nor Stan think they have a problem and want nothing more than for Randy to admit his problems. I'm not having a glass of wine. I'm having six. It's called a tasting and it's classy. Look, no offense, Stanley, but you grow up stern into your dad. Don't judge. Stan promises to stop as he can quit anytime he wants. Okay, I need help. Stan goes to Jimmy asking for help and he has the answers. You've got to reach out to a higher power, Stan. You've got to get down on your knees and you've got to say, I have a problem. And you've got to ask that higher power for help. Stan does as instructed, but he is heard by the wrong higher power. Or so it seems. You have summoned the Prince of Temptation. For what purpose? Okay, this is actually really smart. Without evil, there can't be good, so there has to be good to the evil sometimes. The best way to make sure this stays? Temptation. You gotta put temptation out there too so people have free will and all that. But you know, everyone has their justification and thinks what they're doing is okay. Satan goes on to explain to both Stan and the audience the process of dopamine rushes and why some people get addicted more than others. Stan learns that his father the genes you got from your dad make you more more likely to have trouble with um dopamine regulation and that's why you need to kind of watch out randy even the freaking devil says you have a problem has addiction genes he passed on and stan has to mind his tendencies otherwise he could get addicted to everything and not be able to enjoy anything you know on top of the fact he already has cynicism satan plays the mobile app wait i just realized that satan and stan have similar names and finds that it's boring like satan would rather watch paint dry on a plane that won't take off off, overplaying it. And it's too obvious a temptation. Satan realizes that the app came from the evil land of doppelgangers. I'm gonna need to borrow your soul real quick, kid. Is that alright? Okay. Uh, at least he asked. Told you, kids got demons. I don't do that. Whatever helps you sleep at night, buddy boy. Satan possesses Stan's body and goes to Canada to get rid of the game once and for all, which is being pushed by the Canadian devil. He yells the boots. Oh yeah, I should have mentioned that. Is he the one putting out all those PSAs? Or is he the reason I keep seeing that one PSA about the talking pills? Stan gets his body back and having learned an important lesson about addiction, realizes the true meaning of self-control. Either you control yourself or the devil will steal your body. And his grandfather follows suit. Your turn, Grandpa. If you roll a five or six, you can kill these zombies. You guys want to put some money on it?
Well, those are the Marshmen and sort of Shelly. On the surface, the Marshmen seem to have nothing in common besides a voice actor. But once you peer below the surface, you see that they are very much alike and they all carry a curse. They are all addicted, cynical men just trying to find some happiness in their lives. And like I said before, I've always thought of Stan as you realizing you're just like your parents. And is that really all that bad? Stan realized he had addiction tendencies, but unlike the people who preceded him, he did not try to justify it as some kind of incurable illness. He tried to fix it once he realized how big of a problem it was becoming. Or he realized he could be a time cyst like his father and advocated for a more peaceful solution. Sure, sometimes Stan has failed in this goal, but trying to break the cycle, to me, is always admirable. Oh well, happy St. Patrick's Day! Oh good. And thank you for having me this past week, Boston. Is it bad I thought Cambridge, Revere, etc., even Wellesley, or like Little Burroughs, like Manhattan or Soho, or to the rest of New York City? Boston is really tiny. That's what she-